<laughs> My word, what a pleasure. So, Julia, I want to start today, and thank you so much for joining me for a second time. Uh, my dulcet British tones weren't enough the first time, so thank you so much for this. Thank you for having me. It's so enjoyable to be up here with Mr. Harry Stebbings. So I want to start today, Julia. Tell me a little bit about the backstory. How did you come to found, really, the leader and what we all know today is the, the incredible company that is Eventbrite? Well, the story started around 2006. I was happily focused and working in a totally unrelated career in television development. <laughs> and I, um, my, basically, my career path got hijacked by a serial entrepreneur by the name of Kevin Hartz. And uh, we decided to start Eventbrite together. And Eventbrite really was born out of many years uh, of Kevin's career focusing on online payment processing. He was a angel investor in Confinity Labs, which became PayPal, sure. and then built Zoom, X-O-O-M, International Money Remittance. So when we got together and started thinking about all the ways in which online payment processing still hadn't disrupted or democratized different industries, live events seemed like sort of the last bastion of e-commerce where there was no great platform to serve all types of event creators of all types of events. And so we put our heads together and we met up with Renaud Visage, our third co-founder and CTO, and we started working on building something that could really empower creators to bring people together around the world. Now, we're in a room full of entrepreneurs. I want to start by asking a question. You mentioned the differing backgrounds there. Are entrepreneurs born? Or do you think this is something that one can really transition into over time? You know, I think, well, I think we are uh, interesting examples of entrepreneurs, the Eventbrite founding team. <laughs> Uh, you know, we came together from very different backgrounds and very different expertise. And I, I, Kevin and I are married, I guess that's uh, probably an important point. So I've been able to have a front row seat to someone who I think is a natural born entrepreneur. Um, and I think one characteristic that I uh, observe in natural born entrepreneurs are that they're missing the chip that says this might not work out. So there's this almost eternal and infectious optimism. And you know, myself, I don't feel like I was born an entrepreneur, but I certainly found my passion in, uh, in becoming an entrepreneur. And I think for me, it was about satiating a curiosity and really learning by doing that spoke to me. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think that absolutely somebody can become an entrepreneur even if they weren't sort of you know, uh, born one. Um, I didn't have a lemonade stand growing up. I was a ballerina. I was really good at doing what I was told and sort of following the rules. And um, through Kevin and through other great entrepreneurs uh, around us, I, I think that I've picked up some more risk-taking uh, abilities and skills. I'm sorry, I'm too interested. You said about kind of the, the chip that says it's not possible. Yeah. How do you balance when you're running a company between having that kind of meta vision that kind of empowers investors and the employees as a whole, but also the reality that next quarter's numbers and actually Simon in sales isn't hitting his targets and how we're thinking about the more granular elements of the business. How do you balance between the two? Simon in sales. Simon in sales. <laughs> Um, you're lucky we don't have a Simon in sales, I'm very by lucky. The way. That could have been a reality. <laughs> well, I think the balancing, so as leaders, you have to balance multiple situations and realities. And I think that what I've learned in the thir almost 13 years of operating Eventbrite is that there is not one single truth except for why we exist. Right, so our, our why is really around bringing people together through live experiences. It's around enabling event creators to be able to create any type of live experience faster, better, cheaper. So that's the truth. On the long term and the short term, you have to be able to oscillate between the two. I think that's just table stakes when you're operating a company. In the early days, that meant are we actually going to build something that people will use? Mm -hmm. And will more than just one cohort of early adopters use it? For us, the, our earliest adopters were actually tech bloggers who were hosting meetups 
and using Eventbrite as a platform to gather other people. And they were a great early adopter group because they did not hold back on, on all the feedback. <laughs> all the feedback. And so we really built our product with this high velocity feedback loop and our earliest adopters. But I'll never forget the first day that I noticed that other types of creators were adopting Eventbrite. And remarkably, they were speed dating event hosts in New York. So completely different part of our country, totally different type of event. And I remember thinking, wow, we might actually be onto something. So you're taking these sort of baby steps along the way and with this you know, dream of a long-term vision. And as that scales, just the components get different, but you always have to balance the long term with the short term. So we spoke about kind of the metaphorical Simon in sales, but if we kind of apply it to the team, I've interviewed over 3,000 people, and the majority say that certain employees are destined for certain stages of company scaling. Is that something that you would agree with, or do you think people have that kind of plasticity to move with stage? I absolutely believe that people are capable of having the plasticity of moving with the stage. It's rare, though. Okay. So it really comes down to curiosity. How curious is that individual? And curiosity breeds empathy. How empathetic is that individual towards either the mission or the customer? And that breeds really the resilience to continually learn and grow. And so um, I, I guess like just by nature, it would be pretty hypocritical for me to say I don't believe that somebody can scale with a business since um, you know, I, I had zero experience 13 years ago, and, and here we are. Um, but I also think that it's important to understand when a team member doesn't have that type of resilience or curiosity, because it's not a given. However, when we, when we recently went public, and, and um, on our IPO day at the New York Stock Exchange, we had 10 of our longest tenured, we call ourselves Brightlings, and when I looked at the 10, I was looking at the pictures, I realized that each one had traveled this really interesting journey at Eventbrite, and not one of them was in the original job that they took to join the team. <laughs> and so I think there's something really wonderful about that. I think it comes down to the individual, but I also want to make Eventbrite the sort of more, most fertile environment to cultivate your career. It's in my best interest to retain great talent and help them find development paths. You said about recognizing those individuals. Um, I actually interviewed um, uh, Max Levchin recently, and he said that when there's doubt, there's no doubt. How do you think about kind of assessing when a stretch candidate is maybe that stretch too far and the kind of process that goes with that? Well, again, I mean, I, I love Max, and so I love his, his profound statements. <laughs> um, and and I, I think he has, there's a sort of a degree of truth in that when you start to feel doubt that somebody can really step up and take on the challenge. Um, I think his point is that there is no doubt in that moment. I tend to think of it a bit differently. I think that, you know, when you... When you bring someone into your team, whether you're early stage or late stage, it's sort of um, stage agnostic, you're making a commitment. It's more of a relationship than a transaction. And so there is a, a sense of trust and commitment and investment, really, that happens between uh, the company and the teammate. And so I think along the way, if that trust breaks or if, again, there's a, in, in the characteristic of the person themselves and the individual, there isn't that sense of, of willingness to stretch and resilience and ability to, to learn quickly, then it's probably not going to be the right fit for that right time. More often than not, that happens. Mm -hmm. But there are, there are plenty of situations, especially at Eventbrite, that I, I can see where if not given another, a different opportunity or a different, slightly different path, that person probably would have left Eventbrite and now they're in a brilliant role for their skills and their, their stage of career. We did mention Max Levchin there. We mentioned the IPO. Pre-IPO, you raised funding from incredible, incredible investors, Lee at Tiger, the team at Sequoia. I'm really interested. Imagine 
hypothetically speaking, I'm an angel investment of yours and you're advising me. What would the advice be having been through multiple rounds with some of the best in the world and really having kind of gained the experience there? Oh, gosh. Well, um, you know, I think I, I very much benefit from living with Kevin, who is a prolific angel investor. So I get to watch sort of front row um, as to as to try to pick up the, the patterns that he sees in entrepreneurs. I think it's definitely, at least I would bottle it up as conviction. So strong conviction in mission and vision, a willingness to listen. And a um, so that those are two things that are sort of precariously balanced at any given time because listening and taking advice, but also being incredibly convinced of your path um, are sort of sometimes can be two ends of the spectrum. So I think there's a delicate balance there. And some of the of the most successful entrepreneurs, I think, are able to balance that and toggle between the two uh, realities. And I also think, uh, you know, Part of being successful is just getting really comfortable with failure. And it's, um, it's astounding to me how much time we spend talking about the successes. And we really don't talk about all the failures that happen to get to those points of success. We, as humans, we tend to just forget them. And so I find that some of the best um, entrepreneurs who are attracting great investors are the ones who are really incredibly comfortable with who they are and with failure, but um, just always hungry. And I don't know where the, I don't know how to create a commonality between that, the people who have that hunger. You know, I think that it's, it's innate, it's within, um, but it comes from many different types of people and entrepreneurs. We spoke about kind of the funding itself there. The funding allows for expansion, be it product or geo. I'm always interested, when you have that kind of market saturation element where you've reached maybe the critical mass and you're looking for that additional line, it could be South America, it could be an additional product. How do you think about product expansion versus geo expansion? Well, for us, Eventbrite, the platform is built in a very modular and extensible manner, almost express, expressly for that. We have, uh, uh, for us, it's a huge market to expand into different categories of events and different geos. So in 2017, we powered 3 million events in over 170 countries. And, you know, there's no shortage of opportunity within this mid-market space. It's incredibly fragmented. And so when we think about expansion, it's through our platform and through the capability of our product to be modular enough for us to be able to quickly develop new solutions that fit in a certain geo or category, but also to allow ourselves to be extensible. So we've built an ecosystem that is uh, powering about 100 partners that integrate with Eventbrite. So when we step back and think about our manifest destiny, it's really to induce the creation of more live experiences by being the enablement platform for creators. Um, and, the, and, and the sort of playing field for us is this incredibly large mid-market of live experiences that is in the billions of, of tickets. And so that's what really fuels our, uh, well, our growth and our investment. And I think that when we, when we think about sort of any path to prosperity, it's through product. Can I ask, you spoke about kind of the, the billions of tickets, the massive opportunity that you have, you've you know, had in the past and also have in front of you, uh, something that the public markets have seen. I'd love to say, like, take yourself back six months pre-IPO. What advice would you give yourself in that kind of very momentous time that you now know having been through it yourself? Well, that's a great question. So when we set out to go public and we sort of started the process in earnest, uh, we had three objectives for ourselves. One was that in the, in the process to go public, you hear a lot about how extractive it is of your time. And um, certainly it's a very expensive fundraise. <laughs> so I wanted to actually flip that equation and make sure that we would extract serious value from going public. And so for us, that was part of the drafting of the S1 document, which is, you know, this hundreds and hundreds of pages, pretty dry 
business document. But within the S1, we created the business section. And within the business section, we really carefully drafted our mission and our principles and also what we're building. And so it codified and simplified who we're serving, how we're serving them. And for us, that was incredibly valuable because when you're a startup or a growth company, you're just going, 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 going. And unless you are forced to step back and really put pen to paper in something that is going to live forever, uh, you don't necessarily get down to the level that we got down to during that, that process. The second objective we had for ourselves was to bring in exceptional investors. And so we have had the pleasure of working with some of the best. And at least at, in the IPO, I wanted to make sure that we were able to connect with investors who could help us be better and, and really who we could learn from. Mm -hmm. And the third was to put our, our customers front and center. So to be able to tell our story authentically through the eyes of our event creators, because those are the people who we wake up every day thinking about how we can serve, and they're entrepreneurs in their own right. And so their stories really helped set the backdrop for what Eventbrite has become and what we hope to you know, mean to the world in the future. And so all three of those objectives for me were really important to anchor the team, um, because at times you feel like it's an incredibly tedious process, and I would have to give the team a big shout out for, for hitting all three objectives. And for me, that was, it was worth it. No, absolutely it wasn't. It was an incredible day. But I do want to finish today on my favorite. As you know, you've been through this before. Uh, it's a quick fire round. So I say a short oh, statement, boy. and then Julia will give me her immediate thoughts in 60 seconds or less. We uh, have only five... if I can ask you my own questions at the end. Oh, uh, OK. OK. I'm ready. Sure. <laughs> Thank you for warning me about that one. Um, so your favorite book and why, Julia? Uh, my favorite book is Personal History by Katherine Graham because I find her to be an exceptional uh, inspiration. Okay. Uh, the requirements for a successful CEO transition? <laughs> the requirements for a sex su successful CEO transition when you're married to the previous CEO is to uh, communicate a lot. No, I, I'm sure. Um, how to integrate people through acquisitions? Empathy. Lots of empathy. What's the biggest challenge about acquiring a company? Well, I think it's about um, integrating cultures and making sure that you have a common point of view. And so, you know, I think Eventbrite has done a good job at, at bringing people together around the world through, we've done nine acquisitions. We have an incredibly strong culture, which helps anchor us. Mm -hmm. But we're also really flexible. So I always think about the culture as being a manifest, uh, manifestation of the people at the company at, at any given time. And uh, because of that, when we acquire teams and we integrate them into Eventbrite, the Eventbrite culture has to shift and make room and be flexible. And so I think having that type of empathy is really important. Who inspires you most and why? Can I ban Kevin? <laughs> you can ban Kevin. OK. <laughs> Who inspires you most and why? Um, oh, god, I don't. Can we come back to that we one? We can come back Thank to you. it. Thank uh, you. For someone listening now, what's the one key thing you'd like them to take away from this conversation? You know, I think the secret to success in building a startup through a growth stage company into, well, we've been public for about 60 days now, so maybe check back in a year, <laughs> uh, is really it is just being completely resilient and focused on the mission. I feel like I'm on this sort of monorail journey, and, you know, conviction is the one thing that keeps us going and keeps us as growing year over year. And so I, I just think that gets underrated sometimes. And I, I feel like uh, that type of singular focus is really important. OK, final one. The next five years for you and for Eventbrite, kind of paint that picture. Well, Eventbrite in five years will be powering more live experiences than are even happening today. So our manifest destiny is really to induce more live experiences through our platform. Um, and I think that we're well on our way to doing that. Are you going to come back to who inspires me? I am. This is my next one. Have we thought about it? 
Um, you know, I think it's hard for me to pick one person. Okay. It really is difficult. Um, but I, you know, I look at, I, I really look at other women who have charted the course and who have been uh, great sort of uh, leaders in their own right. And one woman who just joined our board is Jane Lauder. And you would know her last name because she's related to Estee Lauder, but you wouldn't really know a lot about her because she's spent the last 20 plus years working her way up through her family business. And wow. so I always find uh, women who have you know, really put one foot in front of the other and worked hard to be inspiring. And, uh, and Jane would be one of those top, top people who inspire me. Well, I did well to leave you a minute and 30 seconds to ask me a question. Harry Stebbings, what is your favorite food? What is my favorite food? So I was actually asked by Julia before the show, what's one embarrassing thing about me? Just answer the question, Harry. I, uh, I'm addicted to protein bars. What kind of protein bars? Although it doesn't bars? tell, obviously. Um, uh, Grenade, it's a maker protein bar, and they do a birthday cake flavor. And uh, do you, how many do you eat a day? I generally eat five or six a day, and I always travel, actually, with uh, eight in my rucksack. That's really unique. It is very unique. What's the one thing that you don't know how to do in your home <laughs> domestically? Uh, I have some flaws domestically. Um, washing machines are still an anathema to me uh, as uh, dishwashers. Um, so that would be anything my... Anything to do with water. Anything to do with water is a learning curve. Uh, 2019 resolution for sure. And what is the name of your new venture firm? A uh, new venture firm is called Stride.VC, a uh, new UK seed VC fund uh, partnered with Fred Destin. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julia. <laughs> this was so much fun, and I was not expecting that. Thank you. Thanks.